you hear me okay? I'm going to assume a posture of sitting just like you, if that's all right. Is that okay? I'm getting old. No, it's nothing to do with that. Not compared to you, no. Uh, apparently there may well be a live group at uh, Mark's, so I've been told. So um, I'm sure there'll be information on the WhatsApp group if you're part of that life group. If you need any information, as Jim said, please come speak to one of us. We can give you information about what's happening in the midweek life of the church. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ben. It's a real privilege to be a part of things here at, at God Central. It's, uh, it really feels like an extended family, and uh, I love being a part of what God is doing here in us and through us. And uh, there's just so much happening in the life of the church. Uh, some good stuff, some challenging stuff. But uh, at the heart of it, we want to keep Jesus at the centre. Amen. 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 Where's Ian Brown? Ian, come here. You've immediately piled a load of pressure on me this morning. (laughs) No, you didn't really. I'm joking, mate. You didn't. Uh, Do you have a microphone? He just wants to share something that God, he believes that God spoke to him at some point this morning. I don't know if it's on mute. Um. Right, okay. Um, yeah, some of, I don't know, it's just very simple, really. Um, it's just that something that is going to be uh, said this morning, it's going to have a profound effect on someone's life. I don't know who that is or what it is. It's not for me to know. But that person could be here. They may not be. But something that will be said this morning is going to have a profound effect on that person's life. Amen. What he doesn't know is that I'm speaking on the verses where it says, Why submit to husbands? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I've already felt the weight of it. (laughs) Man, in the the last little while, you know, just just, uh, journeying in, in marriage with Nikki for... 25 years um, I feel like I'm in some way qualified to speak on it and in other ways this week absolutely not so um, we, we, we're journeying together if, if that's all right um, and, and jump into some scripture and see see how we get on where's where's Bill gone there's he's not here is he there's just a little bit of top end on this that just needs to be rolled off if that's all right Um, So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 to 33, if you've got your Bibles. Thanks to the wonderful Teo and Tommy for getting everything working. It should come up behind us. Good job. Got to love love technology uh, when it works and hate it when it doesn't. Um, And having lived a life working with technology, it still baffles my brain. So Paul, and as Katie spoke about last week, was talking about living life in the spirit, living a life of love, walking in love, avoiding certain sins and disobedience to the Lord. And now he moves on to relationships. And it's interesting that we... It comes in that order that we really need to... Mate, you can just drop the volume a little bit, as long as people can hear me. You can hear me okay, yeah? Yeah. All right, great. Uh, There's always one. And he comes to our life group as well. (laughs) Well, We love having him around. We love him. He's He's a great guy. But we need to understand life in the spirit. To understand the complexities of relationships. Without... Living a life in the spirit, relationships are destined to fail. And as I said, speaking to someone who's been married to 20, for 25 years to, to Nikki, we've, we've been, through, been through most things. And uh, we'll see how we go. We might, we might share some personal stuff, I don't know, but... Um, This week has been extremely challenging, looking at how we journey through this, not just this topic, but 
gender and gender roles in general. And these are some of the most challenging verses in scripture. It's not easy to get your head around. It's partly due to cultures doing away with gender and gender roles. And I think it's safe to say that there's much confusion and division around these things. And thanks to Paul, who says a lot of unpopular things, we sit here today looking at these verses and... uh, Katie was really thankful for, for, to me for giving her those verses last week. And I very, very, very quickly pointed out the verses that I've got. And the smile that came from her face is one that I haven't seen for a long time. And verse 22, as we'll see, wins the prize for one of the most unpopular things written in the Bible. In the context of today. Some people hate it because they think it endorses male oppression of women. And I want to recognise that actually that may be some of your lived experience. But Paul also writes in Galatians 3.28 that men and women are equal before God. Others hate it because they think it teaches that all women must submit to all men. It doesn't, because as we'll see, Paul is very clear that a woman need only submit to her husband. Trigger words can cause division. We need to be careful that we don't reject words because they trigger us, but we need need to rather seek to redeem them. And Paul embraces our reaction because he cares more about God's creation plan than he does about our approval. It's often the way in scripture, very challenging. But it's actually for us to be transformed more into the likeness of Jesus from one degree of glory to another. So this morning I want to say that we need to recognise a couple of things. We need to recognise that conviction of the Holy Spirit is something that is real in the believer's life. Not condemnation because the Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But conviction. Where God just highlights something in your life and you're like actually that feels a little bit out of kilter. Lord I'm sorry. And I also want to say secondly that the enemy loves to sow disunity I can testify to that it's been a very interesting week in our house lots of tension lots of wrestling with things and after 25 years of marriage Nikki and I hardly ever argue That wasn't, that wasn't Nikki laughing, that was our daughter. <laughs> most, of our, most of our, not arguments, but discussions are, are largely in jest. Or Nikki pestering me. <laughs> and me just graciously receiving it. <laughs> it's not always been the case. The first... Five years of our marriage were horrific. Married at 21. Child born before our, or well my, well both of our 22nd birthdays. Only, only, only like a few days, mind. Two days before my 22nd birthday. And um, for complete transparency, Marrying Nikki, for those of you who know, she's uh, from South Africa. I'm born and bred in Harlow, representing. And uh, bringing those cultures together made for an interesting time. And for complete 
Don't apologise. I am the person today in the Lord because of the role that you've played. For the first two or three years of our marriage, hear me on this. This is just for complete transparency. Many of you know this already, but I think it will help. I used to pray that Nikki would die. Because before God, the Bible said that divorce wasn't an option. And I'm like, Lord, the only other option as I see it is that she goes to you in paradise. <laughs> and you can, you can, you can, yeah, she, you know, she's yours. Um, I'm so glad that God never answered those prayers. <laughs> He's done an amazing work in our, in our lives individually and as a, as a couple and we knew that God called us to be married. We knew that, even at that young age. Partly, and in most part, because we loved each other. But secondly, we wanted to make a stand for, for marriage. It was, it was 25 years ago. And, and to be a testimony to those who maybe don't believe in the sanctity of marriage or have a skewed view of marriage. We, we firmly believed that God wanted us to be together. And there was a number of couples at that time that got married that we, that we knew within the church, and many of those people are not together anymore. And we were the, we were the black sheep of the marriage preparation group. <laughs> There's no way these guys will stay together. 25 years later, we're still going strong. And no matter what the enemy throws at us, even in this week, we stand for Jesus. And our marriage is, because of the grace of God, a testimony to, to a number of people. So I want to say this morning, let's be soft-hearted. Let's be soft-hearted with one another. Let's be eager to maintain unity. Steph Liston, who was here a few weeks ago, says this, the way we treat one another has the power to maintain or undermine what Jesus brought for us on the cross. It doesn't undo it, but it affects us living in the good of it. It's impossible for me to cover the whole topic today, so we're just going to hone in on Ephesians, okay? It's uh, something that uh, we're hopefully going to be tackling later on in the year. Sexuality, gender, these kind of things, we want to unpack that a little bit because we recognise that um, it's a big thing in our society today and we, we mustn't shy away from these things and that's partly why we like to tackle books of the Bible rather than preach on topics because if you go through the whole of the Bible you're covering everything and we don't shy away from challenging verses so um it's partly going to be helpful if, if you understand the terms egalitarian and complementarian this morning. Do you guys know these things or, or not? So there, there's, within the context of this, is, it would be uh, two different views on gender roles and relationships. Egalitarian would, be, would have its emphasis on the equality of men and women. Complementarianism would have its influence, uh, emphasis sorry, on the complementary differences between men and women. It's a bit funny, really, because egalitarians believe that men and women are designed in a complementary way, and complementarians believe that men and women are equal. Egalitarians believe in essentially symmetry between men and women, a symmetry that other than all of us looking to be more and more like Christ leaves no other important things to say about how a man and a woman ought to conduct themselves in the church and in the home. Complementarians want to talk about the asymmetry between men and women and the various distinctive implications involved in this. If you zoom in, you'll find issues of authority and responsibility are where the grenades are dropped. I added that bit about the grenades. So I've I've really done a lot of study and a lot of research and just spent a lot of time listening to sermons and trying to formulate something usable this morning 
that is coherent and uh, um, hopefully we're going we're gonna to do that. I'm, I'm sorry about time. We're going to really try and go through this quickly. Uh, but uh, Paul's talking to believers this morning. So he says in 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, before we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I thought it was a little bit of a get out, get out when it talked about the mystery is profound and it's referring to Christ and the church. I'm like, we'll just do that and we'll go home. But uh, we need to unpack it a little bit. It's helpful if we read it correctly. And you can't, you can't go into 22 without looking at 21. And uh, it's best read, submitting to one another, wives to husbands and then so on. It's a mutual submission across all relationships. However, Paul goes on to talk about leadership patterns and headship. I want to say this morning that in no way does it mean that the wife is any less inferior is not any less human or any less Christian. Doesn't mean that she's less gifted, less intelligent or anything along those lines. It means teamwork between a husband and wife. And we see here that the husband is the team leader within this context. And we look at society and Areas of business, politics, and all of these things, we see very successful women. And that's to be celebrated in God's design. But in some ways, it's helpful to go back to the beginning, right? Where there was no sin. And God said that the world was good. So we're going to go to Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. what I've called the overview. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them, let them have the minion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing, thing sorry, that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Mankind is made in his image. And only together can we fully express the image of God. We were created to rule together. And you can see a little bit of symmetry about it. And we're going to go to Genesis chapter 2 verses 18 to 24. Well, I said we'll drill down into the finer details. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God have formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to man to see what he could call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. 
So the, so the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs, closed it up in its place uh, with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She, she, will be, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Heard that before already this morning. Look at Adam's response to seeing Eve. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. It's not one of difference, but one of similarity. Oneness. There was a familiar look about this. It wasn't a, it wasn't a weird looking, I don't know, think of the most ugly animal you can think of. But there was similarity. And it wasn't about equality. It's not talking about equality. The Bible assumes this. We're both equally made in the image of God. Doesn't need to point that out. But it's about unity. Oneness. And because of the outrageous inequality in our culture, it causes problems. But the biblical, influence, uh, biblical emphasis is on unity. Genesis 2 verse 7, God formed man, Adam first. Genesis 2 15, Adam is entrusted with working the Garden of Eden. There's something unique. He's carrying some form of responsibility to look after the garden. And actually, the symmetry of Genesis chapter 1 changes when we drill down into the finer details. Genesis 2 verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. What do you think of when you hear the word helper? Anybody want to be brave enough to... Okay. Any other... Any other... Fam- family. Okay, yeah. Yeah. For some people, the word helper within this context can be a real trigger word. Because you can think of it as, and consider it as someone that isn't, that isn't equal with the person that they're helping. As I said earlier, we need to try and reject the terms. Uh, Try not to reject the terms, sorry. Because they cause us to be uncomfortable. If we change or reject terms in the Bible, then we're going to need to change the way we read it. If we can redeem terms, we can create a new culture and an understanding ground in certain words. In the Old Testament, the word helper is used around 19 times. 15 of those times, it's used in the context of God being our helper. I want to say this morning, there's certainly nothing degrading or inferior to the word helper. If the greater percentage of verses in the Bible, uh, Old Testament, refer to God as our helper, we need to redeem that word and give it its rightful place within the culture in which we live. But Eve has a specific role in stewardship. Can I just say something? I've got a mental stuff. Mm. 
Yep. Yeah. Of course. For a helper, the volunteers yeah. to be a helper is so great. They feel yeah. such pride and importance. Yeah. So you can reclaim that word. Absolutely. Being of value. Absolutely. Absolutely. We need to. Talking about redeeming, redeeming things. God's redeeming us, right? He's redeemed us. Thank you. So what does it look like in marriage? So husbands have a... And I'm, we're talking in the context of husbands and wives, but actually we can see in the verses that it's talking about Jesus and the church. And Actually, if you're single, this stuff is still relevant for you. Okay. Maybe you'll get married one day. It's good prep. Maybe you'll never get married. But one day you're going to be married to Christ. It's good prep. <laughs> All round. So husbands have a uh, representative responsibility to lead his wife and family in its faithfulness to God. Husband has a representative responsibility to lead his wife and family in its faithfulness, in their faithfulness to God. If husbands are being consistent in this, they will feel the need in the depths of their spirit for a godly, trusted, gifted wife to help. We need to commit to the stewardship of headship and equally the stewardship of helping. In Genesis, we see that Adam is living in a perfect world, in an unobstructed relationship with God. And God says, hold on, it's not good for him to be alone. You can imagine, there's Adam, all I need is you, Lord. And God's like, uh, no. <laughs> Definitely not. You can't see the fullness of God alone. And we can appropriate that to the church as well. For us to see the fullness of God, we need one another. We need each other. But it's vital that we build a vision for both stewardship of headship and the stewardship of helping. Headship will focus on his responsibility and accountability. Learning to become a responsible person. 25 years married, I'm still learning to become a responsible person. Leading the family in their faithfulness to God. Headship rests on a headship rests with the husband who relies on his wife to help him in all matters as he sacrificially serves her for her redemptive progress. Helping focuses on her contribution and necessity. Wives are not an optional extra. We need her perspective and her gifts. We look at God the Father. God is the head, but he loves to exalt, honour and shine a light on the Son. His Son, Jesus. Skipping towards the end, Paul closes with a two-point summary. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the, and let the wife see that she respects her husband's. He doesn't see the need to add anything more than these two points. Sometimes wish he would, right? It would make it a lot easier if there was just this. Twenty five point plan to the perfect marriage. Perfect relationships. But actually those two points are key to every other matter. Underneath that, if the wife allows her husband to lead, and if the husband is a man of love and honour, all should be well. There may be a thousand other things to be attended to, 
that these are the starting point. If either of these matters is disobeyed or out of kilter, there's no starting point. And the hopes of recovery diminish. Husbands should love to exalt, honour and shine a light on our wives. If we get this right, everything else will fall into place. Finally, we need to speak about Jesus. He is our model. He gives us a plumb line into the creation narrative that we looked at this morning and we have to anchor into it. It's interesting that Jesus' first explicit self-disclosure is to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And Jesus' first resurrection appearance is to women. We look at Jesus' headship. He took sacrificial responsibility for his bride. And this is the only legitimate way to express headship as far as God is concerned. Jesus' voluntary submission to the will of God demonstrated his love, humility and obedience in fulfilling his mission to redeem humanity. It has to do with honouring the creation order rather than ability. It's the will and design of God. As I mentioned earlier, in the end we'll all be married to Jesus. United with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We ourselves need to honour the original creation, but hope for the things to come in the new creation. We, we know in part, and the mysteries of God will continue until the end of the age. I could go on. We just wanted to shine a light on this and I want to say that for us here at God Central, we value value our ladies, married or not. If you're married, we love you and honour you, pray for you. If you're single and ready to mingle, we love you, we pray for you, we honour you. We recognise that actually we... We need each other and recognise that we're all created in the image of God. We also recognise that there are some roles around headship and stewardship and helping and within the context of marriage that we need to speak into. And I recognise actually this morning for some of you, this may be great. For others of you, this might be like, oh man. I want to encourage you to continue the conversation. I'm happy to chat. Nikki and I are happy to chat. I'm sure Menard and Debs are happy to chat. By, by no means got it sorted, but 25 years without killing each other is a testimony to the grace and the mercy of God and something must be working. <laughs> The day is still young. There's still, there's still time for you to clean the house. <laughs> joking. I'm joking. <laughs> and do the garden. <coughs> no, joke. Um, so, as a as a leadership team and as elders and wives and just the wider conversation, a little bit about what Grace um, spoke into this morning. I think we recognise that, and it's very unusual within, now I'm I'm not talking within marriage now, I'm talking within the life of the church, that actually God has done something with with the guys in the church. There's this 
I don't know, there's just a lot going on with the guys and relationships are being formed and God is doing something with, with the men. And um, we recognize that and conversations outside of God Central. Um, this is not always the case within church. It's normally the ladies that are thriving and surviving and doing good things together and the men don't really do much. But through conversation with ladies, through prayer and, and, and other things, we recognize actually that there may be something in the spirit that is hindering our ladies getting together and doing life together. There's little pockets of it for sure. I'm not saying that, but I think there's some... Not me, we. There's a lot of ladies that are suffering with chronic illness. Okay. We we believe in a God that heals. Amen. We also believe in a God that, you know, through the trial teaches us things. As we see in the book of Job and various other places in the Bible. recognize there's a lot going on it negatively impacting our ladies and I don't know about you but I've had enough of it I've had enough so in light of that what we're going to do this Friday is prayer and fasting it just leans itself very nicely to Give that time over to praying for breakthrough, for praying, uh, uplifting our ladies to the Lord. I'm speaking specifically to the guys here, but ladies, you're also welcome. But I want to see a large group of people gather on Friday night to pray. 7.30. To pray specifically into this because I believe that our women have and the ladies within the church have a huge role to play not just in the life of the church but in the community and just recognize that we need to just come before the Lord if we're serious about these things so just a challenge for you guys ladies also we're welcome more than welcome but we're going to be petitioning God on Friday seeing breakthrough because we love our ladies, man. They're, they're awesome. Huge amount of gifting. Just beautiful, beautiful people. We love you. And it will enable us to, to grow and develop as a church family. And uh, God calls us to be disciples. He also calls us to be fishers of people. And um just going to shine a little light on, on, on Nikki. She, you know, she, she loves to do art, but she struggles, you know, with health. And But uh, Menard had a picture about casting the nets. And uh, we wanted to, well, Menard felt that it would be good if we could have some representation of that as a, as a, as a reminder, as a, as a, maybe a, a gentle kick up the backside that actually we're called to be fishers of men and women. And Nikki, you may have seen, we put a little bit of art on the on the drape there we're casting out the net to to bring in a multitude of fishes and uh, I want to see this black drape aside from the projector screen when it works full of prophetic art full of things that challenge us, that remind us, that invoke 
things in us to either be reminded of the goodness of God or to be reminded that actually we're called to a bigger picture than just our gathering on a Sunday morning. So that'll be up every week, just as a reminder for you all. And coming off the back of probably a month of, more than a month of, an emphasis on evangelism, making disciples, testimony, sharing the gospel. So, amen. I just want Nikki to read something that she's... um, Sent, from, sent to me this morning. I think it will help. And then we're just going to pray. Sorry if I've run a little bit, but it's an important topic and a challenging topic. And it's just right that we give it, give it the right amount of time. And as I say, we will delve deeper into these things more fully. Here's the better half. Probably wish that she would have spoken this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> this week I've been crying a lot, and it's not like me to cry. And I was like, God, how do you see women? How do you see them? Because you only had male disciples. And I just, like, I I didn't want to know what other people thought. I wanted to know if my daddy God thought about me. And I've been sobbing. I was, like, resting. I was like, I'm having a Jacob moment here. (laughs) Walking with a limp now. But um, not really. Um. And then during worship, I've come to peace and I've been reading a lot and a lot of research and stuff that we've done together this week. And um, during worship, but God just gave me this word and I quickly wrote it down. So I'm just going to read it. And it's about diamonds. And diamonds are precious and hard. They are things of incredible beauty and also hard. Hard, so hard that they can be used for many different engineering tools. So varied that you could wonder how they are all the same thing. But they are all diamonds. Just like humanity, we all created in the image of God, yet used in different ways. Women are not less valued just because we are used by God in some different ways. We are, in fact, very precious to him. And this morning during worship, it was like you have to sometimes hear it from God for it to really sink into your spirit. But it really got that sense like you have no idea how precious you are to me. And that's how he sees us as daughters of the king, like we're actually really precious. And the roles that he puts us in sometimes are for our own protection. And you wouldn't use a perfectly clear, beautifully cut crystal diamond to polish a concrete floor, would you? That would be such a waste. The kind, the kind of diamond that shows its true worth when light shines through it. God wants us to allow him to shine his glory through us. Amen. Amen. We're going to finish. If you want to chat more, please do come and chat. Whoa. Fade in. Nice. (laughs) Please do come and chat to to Nikki, myself, Mel, Debs. I'd love to engage in conversation with you. We're going to finish there. We're going to finish by singing. I could sing of your love forever again because we could just sing about the love of God forever, right? Because he's good. He's faithful. He's true. Uh, during the song, if you want to collect your kids, it'd be really appreciated. Uh, I heard my mum there. I ain't finished yet. <laughs> uh, we're nearly finished. <laughs>